Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvellous video. Prophecies and dreams have always been a big part of the Game of Thrones world, and House of the Dragon has kept that tradition alive. You might think that the Targaryens derive most of their powers from their dragons, but that's not entirely true as they also wield the power of prophecies. The Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon, digs deeper into the Targaryen family's rather familiar magical mystery about the prince who was promised, dragon dreams, and dragon riders. In the first season of this prequel, dragon dreams are seen to become the most important part of setting the core of the entire show. These visions heavily influenced King Viserys' decision about who should be his heir and ascend the Iron Throne. Some fans even believe that these dreams are the real reason behind the Targaryen civil war that's set to explode in Season 2, right from the first episode of House of the Dragon. It's clear that visions will be a big deal. King Viserys keeps talking about several prophetic dreams that have shaped the Targaryen family till his last breath, although in the beginning he mentions a dream where he saw his son being born wearing a crown. Later, he reveals that Aegon the Conqueror, the Targaryen who united the Seven Kingdoms, had a vision of a great threat from the north that would endanger everyone in Westeros. These prophetic dreams eventually play a crucial role in the unfolding story. Even George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire books, which inspired the entire world building of Game of Thrones, put a lot of focus on prophecies. These prophecies usually alerted the characters about certain impending dooms that often turn out in surprising ways. In the books, Martin never confirmed that Aegon foresaw the threat of the White Walkers, but now it seems that the vision is officially a part of the main canon. But Viserys and Aegon aren't the only ones to have visions of the future, and they definitely won't be the last. So, without wasting another moment, let's discuss the entire fiasco around these prophecies from the world of Westeros. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. What is prophecy or dragon dream? So, dreams, prophecies, and visions, especially the ones that concern the past, present, or future, form a significant chunk of the narrative in a song of ice and fire novels. While some have been left out from both the shows, several of these dreams have been seen to dominate House of the Dragon and Game of Thrones. Now, the wise men among the children of the forest were known as green seers, and they had the ability to see prophetic visions through something called the green sight. They were identified by their eyes, which were either as red as blood or as green as moss in the deep forest. Besides these wise men, a few others also had the green sight, like Jojen Reed, a Cranag man, and of course Bran Stark from the north. Additionally, some members of House Targaryen and House Blackfyre were known to have dragon dreams, which were also prophetic. However, in Westeros, prophecies often come from descendants of the first men who have the gift of sight, like we saw in Bran Stark. Most members of the House Targaryen are also pretty famous for having life-altering prophetic dreams. In fact, they survived the Doom of Illyria simply because the daughter of the family's patriarch, Daenys the Dreamer, had a vision predicting the disaster. Believing her, the Targaryens moved to Dragonstone, an island near Westeros. Just 12 years before Valyria and all its famous dragon-riding families were wiped out in a massive volcanic explosion. Apart from them, Various religious fanatics and alleged magic practitioners, like the Red Priestess Melisandre and the Wood Witch Maggie, were also seen to have prophetic powers. Yeah. Mountains cracked open like eggs, lakes and rivers boiled. Fountains History of prophecy from the book A Song of Ice and Fire. According to the prophecy that was found in ancient books from Ashai written over 5,000 years ago, the legendary hero Azor Ahai is prophesied to be reborn as a champion sent by Relor, the Fire God. The prophecy states that Azor Ahai will be born again, rising amidst smoke and salt to awaken the dragons from stone. This will happen after a long summer when a cold evil darkness spreads over the world and a red star bleeds. By wielding Lightbringer once again, Azor Ahai will stand against the others and save the world from darkness. We witness the Red Priestess Melisandre often used the name of Azor Ahai along with the phrase of the prince that was promised, interchangeably, though she usually prefers to use Azor Ahai far more often. Anyways, we'll surely circle back to this later while discussing Game of Thrones. Now, during the beginning of the Century of Blood, which was a period of chaos in Essos that lasted for a whole hundred years, Daenys Targaryen, famously known as Daenys the Dreamer, was the daughter of Lord Aenar Targaryen of Dragonstone. She was believed to have the gift of prophecy and wrote a book called Signs and Portents, where she vividly described all her visions. Well, after she alerted her father, Aenar and his family survived the doom of Valyria because they sold all their possessions and left Valyria twelve years before the disaster even happened, moving their entire house to the island of Dragonstone and claiming the castle there by the same name. Scholars believed Aenar made this decision based on one of Daenys's visions, in which she predicted the doom. The event was marked by volcanic eruptions that completely devastated Valyria, killing all the historic dragon-riding families except for Hastargaryan, who were smart enough to leave, even if all the other lords made fun of them for taking such a decision. 
This catastrophic event saw 14 volcanoes erupting simultaneously, destroying Valeria in a massive Pompeii-like fashion and killing most of the dragons. So, at the end, the only family left with dragons and a connection to old Valeria were the Targaryens, which further reinforces how Daenys' visions propelled them to save their house and push it to the pinnacle of power in the years to come. When this great winter comes, Rhaenyra, all of Westeros must stand against it. Prophecies in House of the Dragon. So, in House of the Dragon, it's revealed that Aegon the Conqueror had a prophetic dream, which he called a Song of Ice and Fire. This twist becomes the core of the entire prequel show and changes everything we know from Game of Thrones, reshaping our understanding of the White Walker's defeat. Although House of the Dragon takes place about 172 years before Game of Thrones, which means we see the Targaryens rule almost two centuries before the Mad King's death and Daenerys Targaryen's birth. Even then, its events still have significant implications, as shown in its closing moments. The first episode of House of the Dragon ends with King Viserys I Targaryen naming his daughter Rhaenyra as heir to the Iron Throne. This is actually a very significant decision that'll have a major consequence for the rest of the story. But there's more to it than just naming an heir, because Rhaenyra must now carry the burden of a secret that all Targaryen kings and now the would-be queen have known, which is Aegon Targaryen's prophetic dream that Viserys shares with her. In his dream, Aegon foresaw the end of the world of men, beginning with a terrible winter from the distant Nor. He saw absolute darkness riding on those winds, bringing destruction to the world of the living. According to Viserys, when this great winter comes, all of Westeros must unite against it. For humanity to survive, a Targaryen must sit on the Iron Throne, a king or queen strong enough to unite the realm against the cold and the dark. Now, if you're a Game of Thrones enthusiast, Aegon's dream should be old news to you, as it predicts the arrival of the White Walkers in the Second Long Night. The terrible winter, the darkness, and the threat it poses to the world all point toward the Night King's army of the dead, even though it wouldn't come for another 300 years after Aegon conquering Westeros. Whatever it might be, his prophecy surely adds a new layer to A Song of Ice and Fire, giving it a more literal meaning because ice represents the White Walkers and fire represents the Targaryens and their dragons. This redefines Aegon's conquest from an act of pure ambition and power to a one with a more noble purpose. But Aegon Targaryen's dream isn't even mentioned in Game of Thrones, nor does his specific A Song of Ice and Fire prophecy appear in the main book series, which means this is a brand new concept introduced solely in House of the Dragon, but it's still very similar to other prophecies about the White Walkers and how they'd meet their end. For instance, as I've discussed before, Azor Ahai is prophesied to be a great hero who will wield the burning sword Lightbringer. The prince that was promised prophecy, often used interchangeably with Azor Ahai, is also said to have a song of ice and fire, and both of these prophecies are rooted around the same idea of the duality of ice and fire at the end of the world. While it's too late for Aegon's dream to be included in Game of Thrones, it could still appear in George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire books. Martin still has two different novels to finish, one being The Winds of Winter and the other being A Dream of Spring. Both of these books will set up the others, the book's name, for the White Walkers as the main threat. Martin always spends more time on prophecies than Game of Thrones did, and since Daenerys hasn't yet arrived in Westeros in the books, there's a good chance this prophecy will be revealed in the text eventually. But most importantly, Martin co-created House of the Dragon and approved the inclusion of Aegon's dream, which only suggests that he might make it a part of the book's canon as well. You will have a dragon one day. He'll have to close an eye. I know it. Elena Targaryen's prophecies. In the lore of A Song of Ice and Fire, Elena Targaryen is King Viserys' first Targaryen's daughter by Queen Alicent Hightower. Following the Targaryen tradition and their mother's wishes, Elena marries her elder brother Aegon. Right from the beginning, House of the Dragon clarifies Elena's lack of ruthlessness or any other Machiavellian traits that most Targaryens often have. Even then, she's still a part of the Green Faction and stands proudly among the Targaryens at Aegon II's coronation in the Dragon Pit. However, she doesn't involve herself in the daily affairs of the Red Keep or Targaryen politics. Instead, she spends most of her time with her twins, Jaehaerys and Jaehaera. Even as Aegon's second wife and Alicent's daughter, Elena is rarely ever taken seriously, especially because nobody can comprehend her gibberish rants, which slowly turn out to be prophecies as the prequel show progresses. In House of the Dragon Season 1, Episode 3, when Alicent was pregnant with Helena during Aegon's second name day, Viserys started to second-guess his decision to name Rhaenyra as his heir. As Rhaenyra became more disagreeable with her father's decisions, he confided in his heavily pregnant wife about how many in the Targaryen line have been dragon riders, but only very few have had the privilege to become dreamers. The might of a dragon is nothing when you compare it to the power of prophecy, and it was almost like Viserys poetically predicted the birth of a prophetess in the show. By episode 6 of the show's first season, Elena was all grown up and bonded with dream fire. We first see her examining a millipede on her hands, while her mother looks at her with awe and insinuates how Helena was beyond her understanding. She also doesn't really like Alicent's embrace, and seems to be relieved when the moment is interrupted with Aemon Targaryen being brought back from the dragon pit. Now, unlike his 
siblings and nephews, Amon hadn't yet bonded with a dragon and often got himself into trouble while desperately trying to claim one. When Helena hears Alicent assuring Amon that he would eventually bond with a dragon when the time is right, we hear Helena quietly muttering about how he'd have to close one of his eyes. Of course, it feels like a mad girl's contextless ramblings then, but later this becomes one of Helena's first prophecies to come true when Amon loses an eye at the hand of Lucerus Valerian but gains Vagar, the largest living dragon, after Lena Valerian's funeral at Driftmark. Now, during Lena's funeral, Aegon notices Helena's unusual behavior as she sits alone, engrossed in studying a spider, and begins to mutter her famous spider prophecy that states how hand turns loom, spool of green, spool of black, dragons of flesh weaving dragons of thread. This line cleverly hints at the Dance of the Dragons, which is the name given for the Targaryen civil war over the royal succession between Aegon II and Rhaenyra. As the King's Hand, Otto Hightower schemes, it leads to the formation of two factions, Rhaenyra's Blacks and Alicent's Greens. These factions will soon take their real dragons into war in the newly released Season 2 of House of the Dragon. The references to looms, spools, and weaving also suggest how the events of House of the Dragon will eventually be seen as a part of history. Anyways, as Helena spoke her prophecy, Aegon looks at her in disbelief and disgust, while Aemon remarks that he would have married her if their mother had arranged it in order to do his duty to keep their Valyrian bloodline pure. After witnessing the division in her family and cryptically hinting at the impending war between real dragons, Helena flies away from Driftmark on her dragon, Dreamfire. Again in Episode 8 of the first season, in between the celebratory Targaryen dinner, Helena alerts everyone to beware of the beast beneath the boards, and while it makes no sense then, it comes alive very soon. In the next episode, Helena's words are again played as a voiceover while focusing on Alicent's tensed face. Alicent is trying her best to claim Rhaenyra's throne for her son, Aegon, shortly after Viserys' death. Meanwhile, Helena talks to the caretaker of her twins, who struggles to understand her cryptic message that expresses how people are often destined to desire what others have, which is why when one person has something, another often tries to take it away. While Rhaenyra was named as the heir to the Iron Throne by her father, Alicent, Otto, and Aemond also want it for themselves. Since Alicent already holds the Iron Throne and the Red Keep, Rhaenyra's faction also doesn't stay silent, which makes it clear that the Targaryen War is on the horizon. Later, when Helena's mother and grandfather come to her looking for Aegon, she remains unaware of their intention. Once again, she cuts Alicent in between to mention the beast beneath the boards, which finally comes alive before Aegon II's coronation as the King of Westeros. Ultimately, Helena's warning proves to be true as Rhaenys and her dragon Melis burst through the floorboards of the dragon pit during Aegon's coronation, causing chaos and many casualties after Aegon's unjustly crowned as the new king. Again, with the first episode of the second season being recently released, when Aegon II goes into Helena's room to look for his five-year-old son Jaehaerys, Helena mentions she was scared. Now, Aegon thought she was talking about the slow-brewing civil war, and assured her that Vagar can take care of Rhaenyra's dragons if they were to attack. But Helena wasn't scared of the dragons. She said she was scared of the rats. Of course, nobody understood her yet again, and Aegon even went on to comment how the queen is a mystery to all. But soon, this mystery becomes reality during the blood and cheese scene when Daemon hires assassins to invade the Red Keep and bring in the head of Aemon Targaryen. However, after going in, disguising themselves as rat catchers, blood and cheese couldn't track down Aemon and instead found themselves in Helena's room at the dead of the night. While they didn't find anyone of use there, blood and cheese definitely found Helena with her two children, Jaehaerys and Jaehaera. Well, Daemon did say, a son for a son. So, after making Helena choose her son, they cut off the head of little Jaehaerys, thus explaining why Helena was scared of the rats in the first place. all prophecies shown in the Game of Thrones. So, it was George R. R. Martin himself who mentioned how with every prophecy mentioned in the show or the books, people often tend to forget that many prophecies often turn out to be false. But still, people heavily rely on them, because the rare few that do turn out to be true are the only ones held up as a highly valued example through the course of history. Even though prophecies are pretty significant, most of them are often interpreted incorrectly, given how vaguely they're worded. That means, instead of being alerted of the inevitable, they're actually misguided toward the future. Even Tyrion Lannister agreed, calling the concept of prophecy a half-trained mule that seems to be useful, but kicks you in the head when you allow it to get to your head. Like Martin has said, prophecy is a staple element in fantasy, but it is indeed tricky. Most characters want to play with the idea of prophecies coming true, but in unexpected ways. The essence of a prophecy is the need to keep the events leading up to it to be completely unpredictable. Shakespeare is a great example of this because in Macbeth, it's said that when the forest of Burnham Wood comes to Dunsindane Castle, Macbeth will fall. Sure, everyone laughs at the idea idea of a forest moving to a castle, but then we see Malcolm's army using branches as a camouflage, thus making the prophecy come true in a rather surprising way. Plus, during the War of the Roses, a lord was told he'd die at a certain castle, so he avoided it at all costs. 
However, during the First Battle of St. Albans, he was wounded and died just outside a pub that had the same castle as its sign. So, the thing about prophecies is that it becomes useless when not examined properly with sincerity. With that being said, let's discuss all the prophecies we saw in the Game of Thrones TV show. Starting strong with... Come with me. The Bad Omen of the Stark Direwolves While returning from executing a deserter from the Night's Watch who had actually gone mad with fear after watching the White Walkers brutally kill his fellow Night Watchers, Eddard Stark and his three eldest sons come across six direwolf pups amidst the forest snow. The pups have just been orphaned as the mother was killed fighting a stag. The older men of the Stark crew immediately saw this as a terrible omen because House Stark's sigil is a direwolf and House Baratheon's is a stag. This basically foreshadows the doom that later befalls Lord Eddard because when King Robert Baratheon visits Winterfell, he instantly insists Ned to return back to King's Landing and serve as his Hand of the King. This decision begins to set off a chain of events that ultimately leads to Robert's assassination at the hands of his own wife, Cersei, and later with Ned's execution by Robert's supposed son, Joffrey Baratheon, who in reality is actually a bastard, born out of the incestuous relationship between Cersei and her twin brother, Jaime Lannister. Now, when they discovered the dead mother direwolf and her sex pups, Eddard's bastard son, Jon Snow, urged them to save and raise the pups instead of killing them. While not claiming to have any particular visions, Jon argued that this must be a sign from the old gods to save them, because direwolves were rarely if ever found near the south side of the wall, and there were six pups, exactly matching the number of Eddard's children. Even the gender ratio of the pups perfectly aligned with Eddard's children, with four of them being male and two female. The sixth pup was an albino, which made it physically different from the others, reflecting Jon's status as an outsider among the Stark children. Jon insisted that the gods intended the Starks to have these direwolves, and Eddard agreed. All these wolves played a very important role in all the lives of the Stark children because all of their fates were intertwined with their master in one way or the other. A few months after finding the pups, Bran's direwolf Summer saved him from an assassin sent by the Lannisters. According to the Three-Eyed Raven, Bran was crucial to the upcoming battle against the White Walkers, and this idea was further supported when Summer sacrificed himself to save Bran from a swarm of whites, thus making it obvious that Bran's role in the conflict was far from over. Again, in the case of Sansa's direwolf Lady, we see her getting executed at the insistence of Joffrey and Cersei, even though it was Arya's wolf Nymeria who actually attacked Joffrey. This loss symbolized the beginning for Sansa's loss of innocence, and served as the first major warning to the Starks about the kind of pettiness and danger that Cersei and her son would bring in the future. This was also a lesson Sansa would carry with her from that moment on. While Lady was wrongfully killed, Arya sent her wolf Nymeria away to prevent her from being executed for attacking Joffrey. Since then, Nymeria has been wandering the Riverlands on her own. And this mirrors Arya's own journey after escaping from King's Landing, constantly moving around Westeros and spending all her time training in the free city of Bravos. When Arya returns back to Westeros and encounters Nymeria on her way back to Winterfell, the wolf doesn't even recognize her, which is a sign for how both of their circumstances have significantly changed them. Later, Rob's dire wolf Grey Wind became his loyal war dog, playing a crucial role in several of his victories in the south and adding to his growing fame. Their shared fate tragically ended with both of their deaths, combined with the subsequent mutilation of their bodies. Meanwhile, Jon's direwolf Ghost followed him to the wall and remained his steadfast companion throughout his many adventures. Lastly, when House Umber betrayed the Starks and handed Rickon over to Ramsay Bolton, they presented Rickon's direwolf Shaggy Dog's severed head as proof of Rickon's identity. Not long after, Rickon himself was killed in a cruel game orchestrated by Ramsay himself. the dreams of Bran Stark and of his allies. So, as most hardcore Game of Thrones fans might know, the power of the sight runs deep within those descended from the First Men, like the Northmen, and among them, Bran Stark is the most notable character with this gift of prophetic dreams and visions. After Jaime Lannister pushed Bran out of a tower window, leaving him paralyzed at the beginning of Season 1, the powers of the sight awoke within him. As he rose from a month-long coma, Bran began experiencing many prophetic dreams. One of Bran's first and most significant visions was a recurring dream about a three-eyed raven, and these dreams began soon after after he woke up from his coma. In his dreams, the ravens seemed to be guiding him to the crypts of Winterfell, hinting that somehow he might find his father there, even though Eddard was supposed to be alive and well in King's Landing. Now, Bran's curiosity has always been his boon and his bane. Eager to understand the dream's meaning, Bran asked Osha to take him down to the crypts, where they were surprised to find Rickon, who confessed about having the same dreams. While Osha tried to dismiss it as a coincidence, soon Maester Lewin appeared, looking rather sad as he held a letter announcing Eddard's death. Now, when word of Eddard Stark being held as a prisoner in King's 
King's Landing reached Winterfell, his eldest son Rob Stark gathered the armies of all the northern bannermen in order to march south to war, with his mother, Caitlin Stark, by his side. Just before they left, Eddard's youngest son, Rickon Stark, seemed to display the power of sight. While Bran tried to reassure Rickon that Rob and the army would return, Rickon strongly believed they would never see them again. This grim prediction eventually came true during the Red Wedding, when both Rob and Caitlin were killed, as the entire northern army was massacred. While his brother Rob was fighting in southern Westeros, Bran also talks about his dreams with Maester Lewin, who assures him that magic has been missing from the world for centuries. But then Bran has another dream about the Three-Eyed Raven and asks Osha for advice. He also tells her about a dream in which the sea floods Winterfell, drowning the castle and its people, including Sir Roderick Castle. Osha doesn't provide an explanation. Later, Sir Roderick arrives with news that Torrin Square is under siege, and Bran orders him to take the remaining garrison to help defend it. Following this, Bran is abruptly awakened by Theon Greyjoy, who informs him that he's taken over Winterfell and demands that Bran surrender the castle to protect its people. Bran reluctantly agrees by making a public announcement, and when Sir Roderick returns, he's captured from Torrin Square. Roderick insults Theon, calling him out for betraying Eddard Stark, and then goes on to spit at him. Under pressure from his men, Theon is then forced to execute Roderick. Ignoring Bran's desperate pleas, Theon performs a clumsy execution. Osha then tells Bran that his dream has indeed come true, because the sea from his dream represents the Iron Islands, which have now come to Winterfell. With Osha's help, Bran escapes, taking his brother Rickon, their direwolves, and Hodor with them. On their way north toward Castle Black, Bran has another peculiar dream about a rather strange boy. Shortly after, they all meet Mira and Jojen Reed, who turn out to be loyal vassals of House Stark. To Bran's surprise, Jojen is the same boy from his dream, and the twist comes when Jojen also reveals that he's been experiencing visions for a longer time than Bran and has a better understanding of them. He explains to Bran how the concept of the sight and being a warg works by describing how these visions can show events from the past, present, and future. Not just that, Jojen also shares his distressing dream about Eddard Stark's death in King's Landing and how his father, Howland Reed, pretty much cried when he realized that the dream might be true. Just like Bran Stark, Jojen also had dreams about the Three-Eyed Raven. He believes that they helped him connect to Bran, so it could help him to protect and guide the young Stark. Jojen persuades Bran that these visions were urging them to journey beyond the wall to find the Three-Eyed Raven, thus hinting at its importance in confronting the return of the White Walkers. While Bran Stark's visions mainly came to him through his dreams, Jojen's visions had progressed to the point where he sometimes experienced them through seizure-like episodes, while being awake. After one such episode, Jojen tells Bran about how he saw Jon Snow in a dangerous situation, surrounded by enemies, and this vision aligns with Jon Snow's actual actions at the time, as he was infiltrating a group of wildlings and was planning to return to the south of the Wall. Again, when Bran and his companions go into the north side of the Wall, he tries to connect with a weirwood tree using his warging abilities, and by tapping into his latent magical powers, Bran has a sudden surge of visions, most of which are unclear to him. He also saw a dragon flying over King's Landing, followed by his father, Eddard, being held as a prisoner in the dungeons of the Red Keep right before his execution. He then saw the Knights King of the White Walkers along with a towering weirwood tree on a hill. After coming back to his senses, Bran understands that these visions are guiding them to the Three-Eyed Raven, who resides in a cave below the hill where the weirwood tree stands further north. Now, when he was being held captive by a group of traitors from the Night's Watch at Craster's Keep, Jojen remained calm despite their threats, as he'd already foreseen his death in a vision, and knew that it wasn't happening at that moment. In one of his visions, Jojen saw his hand being engulfed in flames, thus implying that fire will play an important role in his demise. As Bran and the group continued their journey towards north, they eventually reached the cave of the Three-Eyed Raven, but were unfortunately ambushed by the Whites just outside the cave entrance. This is when Leaf, one of the surviving children of the forest, came to help them fight the White by magically casting fireballs at them. Unfortunately, Jojen was gravely injured by a White during the attack. Knowing that he was beyond saving, Jojen urged the others to move forward, and as an act of mercy, Mira chose to end his suffering by slitting his throat. In a poignant moment, just as Jojen was passing away, Leaf used fire magic to ensure that his body burned completely, preventing him from being resurrected as a White as he'd seen in his vision. All of them fled deep inside the cave, beyond the reach of the Whites, and this was where Bran finally met the Three-Eyed Raven, who was then revealed to be the last Green Seer. This wise old man was fused with the Weirwood Tree, thus embodying the essence of nature itself. The Green Seer explains that he took the form of a Three-Eyed Raven in Bran's dream in order to guide him to this sacred place. Meanwhile, Mira was heartbroken that her brother Jojen had to sacrifice himself in order to bring Bran to the cave, but the Green Seer comforted her by revealing that Jojen always knew his fate and willingly chose to help Bran on his journey, as he understood how important his role was in order to help Bran in his quest. Now that he was being guided by the Three-Eyed Raven, Bran experienced vivid visions of the past. He witnessed Winterfell in the days of his father's childhood, and even caught a glimpse of other familiar faces like Benjen Stark, Lyanna Stark, and a young Hodor, who was then known as Wyliss, a detail that rather perplexes Bran. However, each time he dug too deeply into these memories, the Three-Eyed 
graveyard, Raven abruptly brought him back to the present, which evidently frustrated the boy. Later, Bran had another vision of the Tower of Joy in Dawn, which took him into the past, specifically a short time after Robert's rebellion. Here, he saw his father, Eddard Stark, and a group of six men confront the last two Targaryen Kingsguard, with the clash ending with Eddard and his friend, Howland Reed, surviving. Soon, they all heard a sharp scream coming from the tower, and while Bran tried to stop his father from going inside, the Three-Eyed Raven again pulled Bran back before he could explore any further, thus leaving the boy deeply unsettled and angry. But when the Three-Eyed Raven was sleeping, Bran went into a weirwood tree on his own by using his warging abilities. Inside, he discovered the frightening sight of an army of whites being led by the Night King. And of course, Bran's curiosity overtook his caution again as he attempted to approach the Night King. But the encounter quickly turned dangerous when the Night King touched Bran, thus breaching the protective barrier of the cave. As the whites swarmed through the cave, Bran was again caught in a vision of Winterfell from the past where he witnessed a poignant moment between his father, Ned Stark, and his grandfather, Rickard Stark, as Ned prepared to leave for the Vale as a ward. Amidst this ongoing vision, Bran heard Mera desperately urging him to warg into Hodor for protection, alongside the three-eyed raven who also advised Bran to listen to Mera's plea. Now, Bran's abilities only grew stronger as he wargs into both the present-day Hodor in the cave and Wyliss, the young version of Hodor in his vision. But after escaping the cave with Mera, Bran experienced a torrent of visions that simultaneously covered both past and future events. He then witnessed the Mad King Aerys Targaryen's descent into madness, as he was prepared to use wildfire in order to burn down all of King's Landing. Bran also saw the Mad King's ultimate death at the hands of Jaime Lannister, followed by which he witnessed an Aerys Targaryen rising unburnt from the flames, after giving birth to her three dragons. Not just that, events of the Red Wedding and Hard Home also unfolded before his eyes. It was actually much later that Bran understood the truth of what happened in the Tower of Joy, as he learned the truth about Jon Snow's parentage that shocked him to the core. Through his visions, he discovered that Jon was not Ned Stark's illegitimate son, but instead the son of Rhaegar Targaryen and his aunt, Lyanna Stark, a piece of news that was hidden from the rest of the world. I had some of the men talking about the comet. So it's an omen. So it means Rob. The vision of the Red Comet. So, when a Red Comet appeared in the sky after the War of the Five Kings began, many characters began to see it as a sign. However, the comet's meaning was interpreted differently by each faction, thus highlighting how tricky it can be to find meaning in such natural events. Each group saw the comet in a way that aligned with their own hopes and beliefs, showing how subjective such interpretations can be when it comes to such themes. At Winterfell, Bran and his companions also discussed the Red Comet and all its possible meanings. Some believed it signified that Rob would win a great victory in the south, while others thought that it was the Lannister Red, implying that the Lannisters would soon rule all of the Seven Kingdoms. A stable boy was even overheard saying how the comet's blood-red color marked the death of Eddard Stark. However, Osha, the wildling woman dismissed all these interpretations by saying that stars do not fall for men. She believed that the comet heralded only one thing, and that was the return of the dragons into the world. Now, what all of these people didn't know was that Daenerys Targaryen had succeeded in hatching three live dragons in the same time, which was seen for the first time in over a century. The Illusions of Daenerys Targaryen In Quarth, Daenerys Targaryen entered the House of the Undying, which was the headquarters for the warlocks of the region, tasked to recover her stolen dragons. Here, while being alone and holding a torch, she found herself in an illusion of the burnt remains of the throne room in King's Landing, with its roof collapsed and everything around the throne covered in snow. Now, years later, after her devastating attack on King's Landing, Daenerys found herself standing in the actual ruined throne room, where she realized that what appeared to be snow in her earlier vision was actually ash from the dragon fire she'd unleashed upon the city. In her next vision, Daenerys found herself in another illusion where she came out from the wall during a snowy storm and then entered a tent where she saw Drogo and their son, Rhaego. After realizing it was an illusion, she left, only to end up in a room with her chained dragons. Soon, Pyat Pri comes out of nowhere to chain her up, ultimately revealing his plan to keep her as his prisoner forever. However, since the dragons weren't muzzled, Daenerys was able to command them to burn Pri to a crisping death. The prophecies of the Dothraki. Sure, the Dothraki were incredibly brave people, but they were also deeply superstitious, believing in various omens and signs. Shortly after entering the Dothraki Sea, Jorda Mormont told Daenerys about the unusual ghost grass that grew in the Shadowlands beyond Ashai. Mormont mentioned how this grass glows in the dark and kills all other plants. The Dothraki believed that one day the ghost grass would spread everywhere, ultimately killing everything and bringing the world to an end. Another very important Dothraki prophecy spoke of the arrival of a great leader who 
who they predicted would be the stallion who mounts the world. This powerful cull would be destined to unite all the Dothraki into a single Khalasar, something that hadn't happened since the century of blood. He'd lead them to conquer the entire world. When Daenerys Targaryen was pregnant with Khal Drogo's child, she underwent a special religious ceremony performed by the Dosh Khalin, who with the Dothraki priestesses and the wise women invades Dothrak. The ceremony involved Daenerys eating a stallion's heart without throwing up. After successfully consuming the entire heart, the Dosh Khalin prophesied that Daenerys and Drogo's unborn son Rhaegar will be the stallion who mounts the world. But unfortunately, sometime later, after Drogo sustained a minor wound while raiding a Lazarene village, he became very ill from an infection, and this is when a captive Lazarene healer named Miri Mazdur offered to treat him using blood magic. However, she actually betrayed Drogo and Daenerys. Instead of truly healing him, she kept Drogo alive, but in a rather catatonic state, and when she claimed to use her life to pay for her life, she didn't use Drogo's horse as promised, but took the life of Daenerys's unborn baby instead. It was Miri's curse that caused Rago to be a horrifically deformed stillborn with scales and bat-like wings. His flesh literally fell from his bones when touched. Later, Miri told Daenerys that she did this to prevent Rago from becoming the stallion who mounts the world, believing that it would prevent the world from enduring the same kind of suffering that Drogo brought to a village. When Daenerys asked if Drogo would ever regain consciousness, Miri sarcastically mentioned that when the sun rose in the west and went to set in the east, or when the seas would go dry followed by the mountains blowing in the wind like leaves, Drogo would wake up. Realizing Drogo would never recover from his vegetative state, Daenerys ended his suffering by smothering him with a pillow. She then burned Mirima's dirt alive on Drogo's funeral pyre as a form of retribution. The Visions of the Red Priests of the Lord of the Light So, the Red Priestess Melisandre claimed that she received visions from her god, the Lord of Light, by looking into his holy flames and communing through it. According to legend, when the Long Night happened 8,000 years ago, which was a winter that lasted a generation, blanketing all of Westeros, allowing the White Walkers to first emerge and attack from the far north. Similar ancient stories were also hazily preserved in various forms across the world. As in the religion of the Lord of Light, it was said that a great darkness covered the world, which was eventually defeated by a hero named Azor Ahai. As the Red Priest Thoros of Mia said that according to the prophecy, the champion would be born again to wake up dragons from the stone and then go on to reforge the legendary sword of Lightbringer that defeated the darkness of the world thousands of years ago. Thoros believed that it was a terrible weapon because if the old tale were true, the sword had to be forged by sacrificing a lover's heart. But as they say, that great power demands a greater sacrifice, and that's something the Lord of Light was evidently clear on. Melisandre had also said that in the ancient texts of her religious prophecy, after a long summer, a dreadful winter would start and darkness would cover the earth once again, allowing the dead to rise in the north. And like I've discussed in the beginning, the ancient texts also mentioned that a warrior would draw a burning sword from the fire, and that sword would indeed be the Lightbringer. This warrior came to be known as the Prince that was promised and would be a reincarnation of Azar Ahai, who would lead the forces of light against the forces of darkness in the upcoming battle for the fate of the world. Melisandre was convinced that Stannis Baratheon was the prince that was promised. Even after Stannis's defeat at the Battle of the Black Water, she shared one of her visions with him to restore his faith and stared into her flames until he claimed he saw images of a great battle in the snow. You will never wed the prince. You will wed the king. But I will be queen. Oh, yeah. Maggie's predictions about Cersei's life. So, when Cersei Lannister was barely a teenager, she snuck out into the forest near Casterly Rock with her friend Malara Heatherspoon to visit a famous witch named Maggie who could tell people's fortunes and live deep within the woods. Now, Cersei entered Maggie's hut without being invited, and when Maggie woke up, she firmly asked them to get out. But Cersei arrogantly reminded her that she was on her father Tywin Lannister's lands and then threatened to have Maggie's eyes gouged out if she refused to read her fortune. Of course, Maggie had to give in and then went on to ask for a taste of Cersei's blood as part of her blood magic. When Cersei pricked her finger with a knife, Maggie lit literally tasted a drop of her blood. She then allowed Cersei to ask her three questions, but warned her with a mocking tone that she wouldn't like the answers Maggie was about to tell. Following this, Cersei asked her first question, which was about her marriage to the Crown Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, a union that her father had promised. She wanted to know when they would marry, and Maggie replied that she wouldn't marry the prince, but rather the king. Naturally, Cersei misunderstood this, thinking it meant she would marry Rhaegar once he became king, but we all know she ended up marrying Robert Baratheon in a political marriage that lacked love or affection. 
infection. This happened after Robert defeated and killed Rhaegar Targaryen in single combat during Robert's rebellion, which ultimately led to the downfall of the Targaryen dynasty. Cersei began feeling anxious and went on to ask her second question about her fate. Upon asking if she would ever become a queen, Maggie confirmed that she would be added a grim streak to it by mentioning how when the time would be right, she would be replaced by a younger and more beautiful queen who would eventually take her place and strip Cersei of everything she ever cherished. At first, Cersei thought it might be Marjorie Tyrell who would replace her as the queen consort, but later, when the time came, it turned out to be Daenerys Targaryen, who eventually became the reigning queen after Cersei's death in the Battle of King's Landing. Now, for her final question, Cersei asked if she would ever have any children with the king. Maggie's rather cryptic response puzzled her because the witch said that although the king would father over 20 children, but with Cersei, he would only have three. While Cersei found this odd, she was too young to consider the possibility that the king could have many illegitimate children. Maggie continued to predict that even though Cersei's children would wear golden crowns, their end would be tragic, thus indicating the gold being in their burial shrouds, implying how they would die before her. We saw all of Cersei's fears come true as each of her children met tragic ends. Her oldest son Joffrey was poisoned during the Purple Wedding, her daughter Marcella was poisoned by Ilaria Sand, and her youngest son Tommen took his own life after the destruction of the Great Sept of Baelor. Despite becoming pregnant again, Cersei's life ended before she could have another child. So, those were all the prophecies, dreams, visions, illusions, omens, or any whimsical prediction that we've seen in the world of Westeros. I love how this concept has been used to slowly weave a standalone tale tucked in the craters to connect the overall elaborate storyline, only for it to come to a mind-bending conclusion. With Helena Targaryen emerging as a major key player in House of the Dragon, I really hope we get to see more of her in the future with an evolution of many more layers in her character, rightfully befitted for a dreamer queen. With that being said, what else would you like us to cover from the franchise? Let us know in the comment box below. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.